Well, hello. Welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another episode of your favorite public affairs programming. Like every week, we always seem to have more material than we know what to do with. Today, we are going to focus on something that impacts every single one of us, but we're going to give you more of the historical context. There are things going on right now in world affairs that take their roots from things 40 years ago, roughly. And we've seen a lot of this stuff happen over the last 40 years, but a lot of people look at it as fragmented stuff. I'm going to work today on showing you how all, all of this fits together. So please don't touch that dial. Got a lot of really useful stuff today. But before we get on to that, the first thing I have to say is congratulations to the newest Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch, who was uh, confirmed through the U.S. Senate uh, earlier uh, this morning. You know, today is uh, April 7th. We are not going to be discussing the Gorsuch nomination. That in and of itself is a whole episode, and we're not gonna we're not gonna do that today. We we'll might get we'll, we'll probably get to some of that next week. We want I want to start off with today's Prager University segment. It's one that we've already shown before in a previous episode, but it's worth repeating. Uh, and that's the beauty of our Prager University segments is the fact that some of the stuff can be repeated as world events repeat themselves. So we are actually going to look today at should America be the world's policeman? Because it's an age-old question, uh, age-old as of 20 years ago. So let's take a look and see whether or not the U.S. should be the world's policeman. Should America be the world's policeman? Whenever this question is asked, and it has been asked for nearly a hundred years, the answer is usually no. Progressives will say that it suggests American arrogance, who made America the boss of the world. Many conservatives, especially those with libertarian leanings, will answer that what other countries do to their neighbors, or even to their own people, is of no concern of ours. But here's the question that is almost never asked. What's the alternative? Well. One answer is the United Nations. That's why the UN was formed after the Second World War, to maintain order and protect human rights. And that's why there are UN peacekeepers around the world. But their record at keeping the peace is abysmal. To cite just one example, at least 500,000 people were slaughtered in Rwanda in 1994, while UN peacekeepers stood by. Furthermore, the United Nations' nearly 200 members seldom agree on anything. And when they do marshal a peacekeeping force, its numbers are always small, they are poorly armed and highly restricted in their use of the few weapons they do possess. They are much more likely to step aside when faced with aggression than to actively oppose it. What about dividing the world into spheres of influence? Is that really a good idea? Do we want a world where Russia gets to do what it wants toward democratic neighbors such as Latvia, and Iran dominates its region, and so on? Would such a world lead to peace or to ever more violent competition over the borders of those spheres? And of course, there's an idea that if America leaves the world alone, the world will leave America alone, if only. The Russian revolutionary Leon Trotsky one said that you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. Great powers don't get to take a vacation and don't get to take themselves off the terrorist target list. So we quickly come to an inescapable conclusion. The United States is the world's policeman because there is no alternative and everybody knows it. But what if Americans don't want the job anymore? What if the cop walked off the beat? The answer is clear and well-grounded both in history and current events. When America retreats, the bad guys advance. It's not a coincidence that after the U.S. pulled its troops out of Iraq, Islamic State exploded onto the world stage. And while it's easy to criticize America for its perceived failures in Vietnam and the first few years in Iraq, what about its obvious successes? 
After the Second World War ended in 1945, the Soviet Union sought to dominate the world. It failed for one reason. The United States stopped it. In 1991, we stopped Saddam Hussein and kicked him out of Kuwait. Later, we intervened to save the Balkans. As I write in my book, America in Retreat, the order the US has provided has not only had enormous security benefits for all the world, it has produced phenomenal economic advantages. Global GDP, just 11 trillion in 1980, doubled by the time the Cold War ended a decade later. By 2012, it reached 72 trillion. The debate over the value of an American supervised peace, Pax Americana, should have been settled long ago. But history only settles great debates for as long as people remember the history. Many college students today could barely identify the Soviet Union, let alone explain how its plans to impose communism on nation after nation were defeated. Americans have lived in a relatively orderly world for so long that many have become complacent about maintaining it. Perhaps that explains why, in recent years, the United States has adopted a foreign policy that neglects to do the things that have made that orderly world possible. Commitments to global security, military forces adequate to meet those commitments, a willingness to intervene in regional crises to protect allies and to confront or deter aggressive regimes. If the world's leading liberal democratic nation doesn't assume its role as world policemen, the world's rogues will try to fill the breach. Then the world would be very much like it was in the 1930s when Western self-doubt, war weariness, economic turmoil, American self-involvement, and the rise of ambitious dictatorships combined to produce unprecedented death and mayhem. Not everyone grows up wanting to be a cop, but no one wants to live in a neighborhood or a world where there is no cop. Would you? I'm Brett Stevens. So, that's where we're at. Should the U.S. be the world's policeman? Well, there's yes and there's no. And this is extremely important as we are the remaining superpower in the world. There is no other. We're it. And the United States has to lead in world affairs, whether we like it or not. Uh, that also shows what hasn't, what's happened for the last eight years when the United States hasn't led in world affairs. Under President Obama's administration, the United States took a back seat in world affairs. Um, some might argue that's not even a bad thing. Uh, that, yeah, it's time for somebody else to lead. It's time for other regions to patrol their own borders. It's time for the other countries to solve their own problems. And there's no doubt in my mind that this was part of Barack Obama's philosophy. But something happened on Tuesday. Something really tragic. And it's not that this hasn't happened before, but there was a chemical attack in Syria and chemical weapons have been outlawed for almost 100 years. Yet, they still pop up on occasion. Uh, a, a last year in Aleppo, Syria, chemical weapons were used. And we go through this all over again. The difference between last year and this year, however, is the change in the presidential administration in the United States. Last year at, uh, with Aleppo, Bra Barack Obama didn't really do anything. Pretty much just let them do what they're going to do. It's, it's over there. Um, President Trump didn't exactly operate that same way. So let's take a look at what happened on Tuesday. Just one day after a deluge of chemical attacks launched on innocent civilians, many being young children, in a northern Syrian town, families are left picking up the pieces of their former lives. Those hit hardest in Idlib are feeling the effects of the deadly attack on a personal level. This father seen here cradling his nine-month-old twins, killed in the attack, as he says a tearful goodbye. And this man in Turkey, recalling the early morning hit where he lost 22 members of his own family in the assault. Now, the global community is speaking out and calling for an investigation into just who initiated the attacks. 
Speaking in Beirut, the deputy director of Human Rights Watch Middle East said that the evidence her organization has gathered so far shows a nerve agent was used in the attacks based on the symptoms victims had suffered. We have continued to speak with first responders, with medical professionals, and with some of the victims who have indicated that this attack is unlike the chlorine attacks we have been documenting uh, for the past several months. The types of symptoms that they are describing are more consistent with a nerve agent type of attack. While Russian and Syrian governments deny they were responsible for the attacks, they indicate that there was some kind of chemical warehouse in the area that uh, was struck and subsequently released these chemical agents. Contacts that we've spoken with on the ground uh, refute uh, that story. And that's what we are trying now to, to assess. And at a Brussels summit on the future of Syria, the EU's foreign policy chief said the conflict had brought destruction and human suffering on an enormous scale. The use of chemical weapons by anyone, anywhere, must stop immediately. Meanwhile, British Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson reaffirmed his position on the possibility of the Syrian government being responsible for the assault. We cannot uh, be certain uh, about what has ha taken place. Uh, but all the evidence that I have seen points to the responsibility of the Assad regime for that horrific attack in which uh, children uh, were killed. And so, uh, in my view, by the way, that shows the impossibility of that regime uh, continuing. The debate over responsibility continued at an emergency UN Security Council meeting Wednesday morning. We know that if nothing is done, these attacks will continue. Assad has no incentive to stop using chemical weapons as long as Russia continues to protect his regime from consequences. I implore my colleagues to take a hard look at their words in this council when the United Nations consistently fails in its duty to act collectively, there are times in the life of states that we are compelled to take our own action. As UN Security Council members call for immediate access for investigators to air bases where attacks involving chemical weapons may have been launched, the cries of children in packed hospital beds back in Syria all what remains from the deadly barrage. Emily Roseman, Associated Press. The United States is compelled to take our own action. And that's what happened. That's what happened last night. When, uh, well, just go ahead and uh, roll the next video. Just keep my mic up. I'll talk over it. Because what you're going to see is where uh, two U.S vessels fired off a total of 59 uh, cruise missiles at an air base in Syria. Um, and with the, with that, it was an attack on the very base where those chemical weapons that were dropped on Tuesday originated from. And this is President Trump's response to the use of chemical weapons. And again, you're looking at the footage that was shot last night and released by the Department of Defense. And those are all cruise missiles that are heading to Syria. That was the United States response. So now, what does President Trump have to say about the justification for sending cruise missiles into Syria. My fellow Americans, on Tuesday, Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad launched a horrible chemical weapons attack on innocent civilians. Using a deadly nerve agent, Assad choked out the lives of helpless men, women, and children. It was a slow and brutal death for so many. Even beautiful babies were cruelly murdered in this very barbaric attack. 
No child of God should ever suffer such harm. Tonight I ordered a targeted military strike on the airfield in Syria from where the chemical attack was launched. It is in this vital national security interest of the United States to prevent and deter the spread and use of deadly chemical weapons. There can be no dispute that Syria used banned chemical weapons, violated its obligations under the Chemical Weapons Convention, and ignored the urging of the UN Security Council. Years of previous attempts at changing Assad's behavior have all failed and failed very dramatically. As a result, the refugee crisis continues to deepen and the region continues to destabilize, threatening the United States and its allies. Tonight I call on all civilized nations to join us in seeking to end the slaughter and bloodshed in Syria, and also to end terrorism of all kinds and all types. We ask for God's wisdom as we face the challenge of our very troubled world. We pray for the lives of the wounded and for the souls of those who have passed. And we hope that as long as America stands for justice, then peace and harmony will, in the end, prevail. Good night, and God bless America and the entire world. Thank you. Mr. President, Mr. President what's President. the legal justification for the strike? today. Now the question is, how did we get here? That's really what I want to spend today focusing on. How did we get here? How did we get to where we are throwing cruise missiles into Syria? How do we get to Syria using chemical weapons on their own people? It's a good question. But when you, you got to peel back a lot of layers of diplomacy and war in order to get here. And that's what we're going to start today. I'm not going to be able to, I don't have enough time in the day to go every single little intricate detail. So I'm going to give you the 30,000 the 30, foot level. We're going to take a big picture approach as to the geopolitical nature of how we got here. There's going to be a lot more that we'll be doing in follow on shows. And some of it we've actually already covered uh, in previous episodes, which you can uh, watch on either YouTube uh, youtube.com slash North Star Oasis or on Facebook facebook.com slash North Star Oasis we do between the two we have our, our complete uh, series episodes so we're actually gonna go back a hundred years and I'm gonna just cover that very very briefly here and that is in right after the first world war when they were redrawing the boundaries in that region the Kurdish people were sandwiched in an area between Iraq, Turkey, and Iran. Those three countries, right at that border, all three of those countries were, you know, are where the Kurdish people lived and still live. But there was no independent Kurdish state. And if, the, if those who were drawing the maps, making the agreements, would have carved out a Kurdish section in the area where the Kurds live, I don't think we would be having hardly any of the problems that we're having today. Now, I'm not going to go into Iraqi-Kurdish relations, Iranian-Kurdish relations, or Turkish-Kurdish relations from 1919 to 1974, or actually 1970. I'm not going to cover that. I'm going to start off briefly here in 19. 70. In March 1970, there was a Kurdish autonomy agreement that was reached uh, by the Iraqi government and the Kurdish people. And it was after the first, first Kurdish war, and it created that autonomous region. This is your home. Um, you have three Kurdish governance, uh, 
that were determined to have a majority of Kurdish people. And it gave the Kurds representation in government bodies. And it was the first time that there was a serious attempt to resolve this 60-year uh, running Kurdish-Iraqi conflict. And that really lasted for four years. And then in 1974, we had uh, rebel Kurdish troops under Mustafa Baranzi, who um, was trying to, how, how, how do I phrase this here? Um, he ended up doing a more of a rebellion, revolution, and offensive. And that started a second Iraqi-Kurdish war, 1974 and 75. And so we're dealing with Iraqi-Kurd relations at that particular time. And this is going to be, you know, um, more and more important as time goes on because now we're starting to get into the Iraq-Kurdish offensives then forced the Kurds to rely on Iran for assistance, and that was in March of 1975. And so now you have Iran and Iraq fighting a series of border wars. And pretty soon Iraq and Iran, they're not getting along because of this border war. And then they had a 1975 Algiers Agreement. And I know I'm covering a lot of turf real quick, but we've only got so much time. I had a lot of stuff today. And Iraq actually made some territorial concessions, in, including the Shat el Arab waterway, in exchange for normalized relations. That was going on. Now, the Shat el Arab waterway actually will come to play in uh, five, you know, five years later. And that's why I wanted to st stress the Iraqi-Kurdish relations. Now, this is something that I am somewhat versed in, but I still don't have all of the nuts and bolts, which is why I'm stuttering a little bit here, um, because this is a key part of the setup. But what I really want to focus on is what happens next. Now, in Iraq, during this time, 1968, Ahmad Hassan el Bakr became the Iraqi president in a bloodless coup. His lead deputy or chief of staff was Saddam Hussein in 1968. Uh, under el Bakr, or Bakr um, the Iraqi oil industry was nationalized, the infrastructure was modernized, and there was an attempt to unite Iraq and Syria. But because of that, Saddam Hussein forced El Bakr out on July 16, 1979. So that was going on in Iraq. What was going on in Iran? You had, a, um, you had the Shah of Iran, uh, Mohammad Reza uh, uh, Pahlavi. And while I'm not going to spend time discussing the internal politics of Iran, uh, he did, there, there was an internal separation within the government of Iran. And there were, in the Shah, he, he, was, he was ruthless. Let's face it, he was ruthless. I mean, they're all ruthless over there. But in 1963, the Shah faced opposition from the Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini. And... Then Khomeini was sent into exile a year later, 1964, and part of that, of that exile actually was in Iraq. So you see how this is all kind of getting entwined together? A lot of stuff was going on. So essentially, uh, by late October of, uh, actually, um, Mid-January of 1979, the Shah was exiled. And the Carter administration did not do enough to protect the Shah uh, for other reasons. So Khomeini returns to Iran, and he takes power 1st of February of 1979. And then he actually, Khomeini, was advocating an overthrow of the Iraqi government, which upset Saddam Hussein. And so here we have Iran and Iraq going back and forth, and now 
Hussein and Khomeini are now leading their respective countries. And then the Shah. The Shah is diagnosed with cancer and at the bequest of David Rockefeller of Chase Manhattan Bank, the Shah of Iran was sent to Wilford Hall Medical Center at San, uh, Lackland Air Force Base, San Antonio, Texas for cancer treatment. And he was there for six weeks. He left in uh, December of 79. Uh, Rockefeller, of course, has $500 million of, of uh, Iranian money in his bank. And so then we end up having a, the Muslim student followers of Imam's line had stormed the U.S. Embassy, November 4, 1979, and held 52 of our Americans hostage for 444 days. See, this is all of the geopolitical or regional conflict, sectarian stuff going on as power was coalesced between Iraq and Iran in 1979. 1978, 1979, things formed up and you had two major countries opposed to each other. So now let's take a look at some video from the uh, embassy storming November 4th, 1979. Now part of the consequence of the Tehran embassy storming was the freezing of Iranian assets in the United States, and that included, of course, David Rockefeller's Chase Manhattan Bank. And Rockefeller knew that. He knew that by, uh, by that time, the Iranian, uh, the Iranian government under Ayatollah Khomeini was already making massive withdrawals from that bank account, and Rockefeller didn't want that cash to leave. And I kind of think that Rockefeller, he understood geopolitics. He knew what was going on. Rockefeller got what he wanted. I also think that Rockefeller didn't realize that the hostages would be there for 550 or 444 days, but they were. And now, for the American people back home, and I was uh, eight years old when this happened, and I remember watching all of this stuff unfold. And every night we would have uh, Nightline. Nightline was the TV show that was created out of the Iran hostage crisis. We, every day would be, this is day number 43 of America held hostage. That's the way the nightly news was. And keep in mind, back then, we didn't have easy access to information like we do today. We didn't have uh, the Internet. We didn't have 24-hour news broadcasting. We had limited ability to capture the news. And so we would see the daily report on what was going on in Iran at that time. Every single day was another day in the countdown. This happened throughout all of 1980. It was also a big deal in American politics and one of the leading reasons why uh, Jimmy Carter lost the 1980 election to Ronald Reagan, especially after the failed Operation Eagle Claw which is also known by, uh, by the name Desert One. This was the, um, one of the first American desert operations that we had conducted in the Middle East, uh, taking off from Asira Island, Oman, a place that I've actually been to. Uh, they flew to a uh, base in uh, Iran called Desert One, and essentially our Delta Force, this is one of their first operations, was going to go and actually storm the location in Tehran where our hostages were captured and rescue them and bring them home. And I believe if that would have actually been successful, Jimmy Carter could have been re-elected president. But it failed. And having looked at that particular mission and talked to some of the special ops people who were part of that, um, a lot of that just came from the fact that our equipment wasn't used to operating in desert conditions. And perhaps sometime in the future, I will do a, 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 at least a big segment on uh, Eagle Claw Desert One. But the, mes mes the mission was fa a failure. 
A uh, few aircraft and helicopters ended up crashing into each other. We lost American service personnel in Iran in this mission. It was a failure when it was highlighted on the press that made the Carter administration look even worse. And so then um, on the day that Ronald Reagan was inaugurated, uh, literally at noon, right after Reagan swore the oath of office, that was when the 52 Iranian hostages were freed. They were sent to uh, Algiers, Algeria, and then flown home. That crisis was averted, but there were a lot of other things that were continuing on. Um, but another thing that happened during 1980 actually goes back to that waterway that was captured. And that was a precipitating factor in the eight-year Iran-Iraq war started in September of 1980 and it didn't end until 1988. So essentially uh, during a vast majority of Ronald Reagan's term as President of the United States, Iran and Iraq were at war with each other. So let's take a look at uh, the continuing war between those two countries. So, of course, what you're looking at is uh, some footage from the Iraq-Iran war during those eight years. But while you're watching that, I kind of want to highlight a couple of other things going on in the region that impacted the United States, stuff that you may have actually remembered if you're old enough to have uh, paid attention to the news back then. Uh, we had, of course, in 1983, the uh, Beirut bombing, uh, Beirut barracks uh, bombing, which killed 283 Marines. That was Ronald Reagan's attempt at trying to assert some control over the uh, Palestinian uh, Israeli conflict that was going on, uh, and again, that's just another separate issue, but that was really the first U.S. Uh, terror attack that we've had to deal with was that 1983 Beirut barracks bombing, and we actually covered that on our show a few months ago, so you have to look back at our archives to get more in-depth knowledge about that. We also had a series of hijackings that were going on throughout the 1980s, and so in the Middle East of American people. Uh, we had the Achille Lauro incident where uh, a Jewish American, Leon Klinghoffer, was thrown overboard the Achille Lauro uh, cruise vessel and killed. And then, uh, of course, as a way of trying to maintain peace through strength, we had the Iran-Contra affair, which another th large thing that I'm not going to cover today, I will make brief reference to it. But what the United States was doing because of the Iran hostage uh, crisis and the Iran-Iraq war is there was a group inside Iran with, of essentially uh, Iranian rebels that the U.S. was covertly backing to try to overthrow the Khomeini government. And then when word got out, um, it was a huge, huge incident. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, U.S. Marine Corps, working in the National Security Agency, 
was one of the people who was uh, brought under uh, U.S. Uh, U.S. Senate uh, trial, and it was a really large deal for American politics at the second part of the Reagan administration. So that was going on there, but something else was happening, and that was uh, the government of Libya under Muammar Gaddafi was also involved in regional terrorism, and when that happened, the United States, per uh, President Reagan, sent a flight of F-111 aircraft from RAF Lakenheath, England, uh, around uh, the European mainland through the Straits of Gibraltar and bombed Libya. And that was April 14th of 1986. If you look at what happened last night with the U.S. Uh, bombing of Syria, you can equate that with what Ronald Reagan did in 1986 with Muammar Gaddafi. It was a shot across the bow. That it was a matter of getting Gaddafi's attention. Don't do this. We will come after you. We're not going to come after you yet, but you're going to know we have military might. That is what happened in April of 1986. That is also what happened yesterday as Donald John Trump reasserts American uh, negotiation skills by strength in the Middle Eastern affairs in Syria. So now let's take a look at what President Ronald Reagan had to say about launching airstrikes on Libya. My fellow Americans, at 7 o'clock this evening, Eastern Time, air and naval forces of the United States launched a series of strikes against the headquarters, terrorist facilities, and military assets that support Muammar Gaddafi's subversive activities. The attacks were concentrated and carefully targeted to minimize casualties among the Libyan people with whom we have no quarrel. From initial reports, our forces have succeeded in their mission. Several weeks ago in New Orleans, I warned Colonel Gaddafi we would hold his regime accountable for any new terrorist attacks launched against American citizens. More recently, I made it clear we would respond as soon as we determined conclusively who was responsible for such attacks. On April 5th, in West Berlin, a terrorist bomb exploded in a nightclub frequented by American servicemen. Sergeant Kenneth Ford and a young Turkish woman were killed and 230 others were wounded, among them some 50 American military personnel. This monstrous brutality is but the latest act in Colonel Gaddafi's reign of terror. The evidence is now conclusive that the terrorist bombing of La Belle Discotheque was planned and executed under the direct orders of the Libyan regime. On March 25th, more than a week before the attack, Orders were sent from Tripoli to the Libyan People's Bureau in East Berlin to conduct a terrorist attack against Americans to cause maximum and indiscriminate casualties. Libya's agents then planted the bomb. On April 4th, the People's Bureau alerted Tripoli that the attack would be carried out the following morning. The next day, they reported back to Tripoli on the great success of their mission. Our evidence is direct, it is precise, it is irrefutable. We have solid evidence about other attacks Gaddafi has planned against the United States installations and diplomats and even American tourists. Thanks to close cooperation with our friends, some of these have been prevented. With the help of French authorities, we recently aborted one such attack, a planned massacre using grenades and small arms of civilians waiting in line for visas at an American embassy. Colonel Gaddafi is not only an enemy of the United States. His record of subversion and aggression against the neighboring states in Africa is well documented and well known. He has ordered the murder of fellow Libyans in countless countries. He has sanctioned acts of terror in Africa, Europe, and the Middle East, as well as the Western Hemisphere. Today, we have done what we had to do. If necessary, we shall do it again. It gives me no pleasure to say that, and I wish it were otherwise. 
Before Gaddafi seized power in 1969, the people of Libya had been friends of the United States. And I'm sure that today most Libyans are ashamed and disgusted that this man has made their country a synonym for barbarism around the world. The Libyan people are a decent people, caught in the grip of a tyrant. To our friends and allies in Europe who cooperated in today's mission, I would only say, you have the permanent gratitude of the American people. Europeans who remember history understand better than most that there is no security, no safety, in the appeasement of evil. It must be the core of Western policy that there be no sanctuary for terror. And to sustain such a policy, free men and free nations must unite and work together. Sometimes it is said that by imposing sanctions against Colonel Gaddafi, or by striking at his terrorist installations, we only magnify the man's importance. But the proper way to deal with him is to ignore him. I do not agree. Long before I came into this office, Colonel Gaddafi had engaged in acts of international terror, acts that put him outside the company of civilized men. For years, however, he suffered no economic or political or military sanction, and the atrocities mounted in number, as did the innocent dead and wounded. And for us to ignore, by inaction, the slaughter of American civilians and American soldiers, whether in nightclubs or airline terminals, is simply not in the American tradition. When our citizens are abused or attacked anywhere in the world on the direct orders of a hostile regime, we will respond so long as I'm in this Oval Office. Self-defense is not only our right, it is our duty. It is the purpose behind the mission undertaken tonight, a mission fully consistent with Article 51 of the United Nations Charter. We believe that this preemptive action against his terrorist installations will not only diminish Colonel Gaddafi's capacity to export terror, it will provide him with incentives and reasons to alter his criminal behavior. I have no illusion that tonight's action will ring down the curtain on Gaddafi's reign of terror. But this mission, violent though it was, can bring closer a safer and more secure world for decent men and women. We will persevere. This afternoon, we consulted with the leaders of Congress regarding what we were about to do and why. Tonight, I salute the skill and professionalism of the men and women of our armed forces who carried out this mission. It's an honor to be your Commander-in-Chief. We Americans are slow to anger. We always seek peaceful avenues before resorting to the use of force. And we did. We tried quiet diplomacy, public condemnation, economic sanctions, and demonstrations of military force. None succeeded. Despite our repeated warnings, Gaddafi continued his reckless policy of intimidation, his relentless pursuit of terror. He counted on America to be passive. He counted wrong. I warn that there should be no place on earth where terrorists can rest and train and practice their deadly skills. I meant it. I said that we would act with others if possible and alone if necessary to ensure that terrorists have no sanctuary anywhere. Tonight, we have. Thank you, and God bless you. Now, Ronald Reagan at least had justification for that strike against Libya, self-defense, the bombing of, Amer of American military personnel at a discotheque in Germany that had absolutely nothing. It was not a military installation. They were not on military duty, and they were not taking up arms against the Libyan people when they were bombed. That was Reagan's justification. Now, going back to last night's uh, Syrian uh, airstrike, a lot of my libertarian friends are maintaining a non-interventionist policy. I've heard, you know, seen this on Facebook all night long, um, and they're all going on. What are we, what are we uh, doing there? Uh, why should we be involved in this? Isn't this a regional matter? It's a Muslim versus Muslim thing. The United States should stay out of it. We don't have legal authority or legal justification into why we did this. It's unconstitutional. I always love that word. It's unconstitutional, except the only legal entity to determine the constitutionality of something is the United States Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court hasn't ruled on it. So until the Supreme Court rules, it is constitutional. 
Now, one can also argue about the War Powers Resolution after the Gulf of Tonkin uh, from 1968. I think it, was, it wasn't until uh, Nixon's era, uh, administration when the, Gulf of the War Powers Act was created. But the fact is, that is justification for the United States in world affairs. Uh, most, a lot of presidents have violated the War Powers Act, including Barack Obama. Uh, he got slapped down and censured over that. So uh, the War Powers Act or War Powers Resolution gives the President of the United States a limited ability to create an armed conflict in another country, another part of the world, um, without having to go to Congress uh, for a period of up to 60 days uh, for authority. I'm not going to get too involved in this, but we saw Nikki Haley at the United Nations making the case that this is a violation of the U United Nations uh, agreement. This is also a violation, uh, and I'm talking about Syria, this is a violation of the uh, chemical arms um, agreement between the United States, Russia, and Syria that came about a few years ago under uh, Secretary of State John Kerry. So there are some protocols that were violated when the Assad regime launched chemical weapons. So there is a legal justification for what Trump did. Now does that mean we're going to send ground troops? Of course not. Uh, if you're going to get boots on the ground, make a major regime change uh, invasion, that's going to take congressional approval. And I don't think that there is a uh, current use of force agreement by the Congress uh, that will be a whole num another uh, ball of wax. But the fact is, the uh, United Nations security uh, resolutions gives us that justification. The War Powers Resolution gives us that justification for a limited duration. And the fact that this was a strategic strike dedicated solely to one military airfield instead of en masse blowing up cities and the population, a.k.a. the bombing of Dresden during World War II, Trump is going to be fine on this. But I really do believe that what you just saw with Ronald Reagan is what Secretary of Defense James Mattis understands. James Mattis understands military history better than I do, and I actually know it pretty well. Uh, but the fact is, um, Mattis, he knows. He knows what Reagan did. He knows it was a limited strike. It was throwing that shot across the bow, and I believe that is what he did yesterday, and that was what was ordered. And, of course, the United Nations was notified, and I'm sure that congressional leaders were also notified before. And I do believe that Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and uh, his counterpart in Russia, uh, they have been talking on the phone since Tuesday. So I know the Russians had some clues to what was going on for a U.S. response. So a lot of the concerns over constitutionality, it's not going to bring those 59 cruise missiles back. Sorry. Uh, I don't think this is going to prolong an engagement for us over there, but I do believe that this is operating under Ronald Reagan's peace through strength policy. Now, how did the Iraq-Iran war end? How did it end? Actually, it was an agreement pressured by many, many countries. It was over one key thing. And that was uh, the bombing of Halabja. Before I get into the bombing of Halabja, I have to mention about the El Chatel waterway uh, because they, the video that I used was only raw footage from the Associated Press. The uh, waterway that was in dispute over the uh, Kurdish-Iraq uh, war, that was actually the target that Saddam Hussein had. Uh, recapturing that was Saddam Hussein's target in September of 1980 to launch the Iran-Iraq war. But then Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons in Halabja, a Kurdish town. And uh, let's take a look at the aftermath. We went in low to Halabja in an Iranian Air Force helicopter hugging the hillside in order to keep away from Iraqi planes and artillery fire. Below us, the ruins of what had been a town of 70,000 people. Geographically, Halabje is in Iraq, but its people were Kurdish and owed little allegiance to the Iraqis. For that, they paid a heavy penalty. This amateur video, filmed by an Iranian soldier, shows the town as it was last week, just after Iran had captured it. Many of the people in these pictures are now dead. 
And the same amateur cameraman recorded the death of Halabje itself the following day as Iraqi planes dropped their chemical weapons. The Iranians maintain that three separate types of gas were used, cyanide, mustard gas and nerve gas. The center of Halabje was badly damaged by high explosive and hundreds of people are said to have died here. But the gas was worse and did more damage in the heavily populated quarters of the town. This man, wearing the distinctive costume of the Kurds, told us what happened. I saw a cloud, I said yes. This is one of the worst examples of a gas attack in this war, perhaps the worst. The bodies which litter this town were those of people who ran out of their houses to try to escape the gas and then were killed out in the open, either by more gas or by high explosive. Apart from the bodies of the dead, there are only a few civilians left in Halabje, people who refuse to be evacuated or who missed the chance for some reason. Otherwise, it's occupied by Kurdish guerrillas, the men presumably whom the Iraqi bombers were out to kill. In a hospital in Tehran, some of the people who had suffered the burns, the blisters and the internal injuries caused by mustard gas in the attack on Halabje were being treated. So, uh, this is Anna. also very sad, you know. Uh, you feel that you're living in the jungle. But in this inconclusive war, now in its eighth year, Iraq uses chemical weapons as a matter of course, and Iran threatens that it may start using them if the outside world doesn't condemn Iraq for it. And in this case, the victims are people who owe allegiance to neither side and know nothing of the war except that they are suffering for it. This is John Simpson for the One O'Clock News in Tehran. And that is what happened, and I'll tell you this, it alerted the eyes of the world on what was going on over there. And it was shocking everywhere that chemical weapons were used. Oh my God, I mean, it's, that was the reaction. Uh, I remember when I first heard this, you know what I asked my grandmother? Who were the Kurds? And of course, grandma didn't know anything about geopolitical events, and so what did she say? She said, oh, they're just people that uh, don't fit in and nobody likes. Of course, she was getting her information based upon what the governments of Iraq and Iran were saying through U.S. TV. Um, I had served in Kirkuk, Iraq, which was a Kurdish area. I met people. I have heard their stories. And as it was told to me that um, every Kurd has a story. I met a couple of people who survived Halabja. I know people who lost loved ones in Halabja. And even years later, I was still hearing their mournful cries. So, you know, when I hear about the chemical attack in Aleppo last year, and I hear about the chemical attack earlier this week, you know, that is really, really frightening to me, especially when we had a lot of innocent children involved. So that forced international pressure to end the Iraq-Iran war. Saddam Hussein was still in power. And what happens next? August 2nd, 1990. He invades Kuwait. Let's take a look. New pictures have reached London of the Iraqi attack on Kuwait City on the 2nd of August. They were taken by an Austrian who managed one of the city's biggest hotels. As Clarence Mitchell reports, they show the early hours of the invasion. These are the latest pictures of the invasion to reach the West. Shot early on the morning of August the 2nd, the battle around the Emir's palace is clearly audible. The view is from the roof of the Kuwait International Hotel. Fearing an attack, the hotel hurriedly moved guests down to the lobby. Three days later and the Iraqi tanks are putting on a show of strength, some apparently finding it difficult to steer, others with engine problems. This apartment block beside the hotel took several direct hits. These pictures were taken by the hotel's Austrian manager, who got out of Kuwait last month with the Austrian ambassador. Hermann Simon traveled to Baghdad and has just arrived in... So the United States responded. We had President George H.W. Bush at the time. And how did he respond? By assisting Saudi Arabia, by sending American military personnel. And Operation Desert Shield began to stop the Iraqi advance at the... Uh, Kuwaiti Saudi Arabian border and then applied international pressure the United States through De Operation Desert Storm uh, pushed the Iraqi army back to Iraq and I was stationed in Kuwait I was later stationed in Iraq 
and that is actually how we got to the Iraq war and that is how we got to actually where we're at today with Syria and the problems that we have over there are still unresolved and as I said earlier in the show the biggest thing that we could do to resolve the tensions over there that genie may have already been out of the bottle a long time ago but have a autonomous Kurdish state that would solve a lot of problems so with that we're gonna end the show today with the Kurdish national song Dallas Pearson producer, I'm your host Jeff Williams, you're watching North Star Oasis, reminding you there's 261 shopping days left until Christmas. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next week.